Welcome to Vitality Made Simple. This is the podcast that empowers you to feel better, look better, and to enjoy better relationships. You know, life is all about relationships, and we are going to enjoy better relationships if we feel good. So, you know, vitality, we want to live strong. We want to be physically, mentally, and emotionally, spiritually, energetic, all areas. We're all one being. So in today's episode, we're going to have a great time. We're going to have a fun time learning about energy with the luminous uh, Dr. D. Anna Minnick. Uh, Dr. Minnick is someone I have um, watched from afar for probably 10 years. She is a certified functional medicine practitioner. She's a nutrition scientist. She's an international lecturer. She's an educator, and she's the author of six consumer books, of which I have all, on wellness topics. And she's also authored or been co-authored on over 50 scientific publications. Now, if you were watching, you, when you're watching this on YouTube, you will think she's a nerd if you heard all that. No, she is not a nerd. She is gorgeous. She is an artist and she has masterfully interwoven color and art into helping us, you know, live with more health and vitality. So welcome, Dr. Minnick. Oh, thank you, Debbie. It is so good to be here with you. And actually, I'm okay with being called a nerd. I think that nerd and artist and author and educator, all those things can coexist. You know, we have so many archetypes. So I like the nerd one because it kind of gets that, you know, sometimes we do need to get a little bit in our head and intellectual. So it's a fun word. (laughs) <laughs> it's a fun word. And um, your radiance and energy are just so contagious and, in a good way, contagious in a good way. And, and I so appreciate that. You've um, you've been quite unique uh, in your incorporation of color as related to health. And, and I, that's just very life-giving, um, Deanna. So, you know, how did all, all of that get started? probably through my own stress and distress. You know, I I think um, what happened for me in my late 20s was I was going through my PhD, lots of long nights in the lab, lots of trying to get things done on time, you know, deadlines, pressure. And I would decompress on the weekends a little bit because I was still even working through the weekends. It was a very intense program. And I remember one weekend, I went up to the art store And I just bought this big roll of paper (laughs) and I bought a bunch of paints and I just laid on the floor and I rolled out this paper and I just got messy. And I remember the first thing that I painted, it looked like a big amoeba. It had a giant black outline. And then in the middle, it was red and yellow. And those colors were very primary, vivid and bright. And when I was done, I cut that piece of paper and then I taped it to my wall so that I could view it. Like there was something about looking at it. It was almost like I needed to reflect back to me something that was inside trying to get out and be spoken. And Debbie, I often feel that so much of healing is actually not verbal. You know, we might try to go to a therapist and talk things out. And I think that that to some degree can be beneficial. I think for me, what I most needed was to have a catharsis. And sometimes we need to move away from our perfectionism, our rigidity, our boxes, our time constraints. And we need to move into the zone of creation, chaos, fluidity, flow, emotions. You know, those kinds of things sometimes need to be released. And I felt in the, this wasn't even cerebral. I just kind of got into that space of letting it out And I do think that there is something about me looking at those colors and the shapes. It was almost like it was a form of nutrition that I was taking that in through my eyes and it was being received back to me in a way that was going to help me. It was like it was communication from me deep within. So I, when you say, how did you get started with all of this? I mean, it kind of started with that particular painting, that particular weekend. And I think from there, every time I got stressed out, I would start to paint. I just got messy. And I didn't like being messy. I've got to say, I'm a really neat person. I'm a minimalist. I like things to be really tidy and organized. But there is this space within us where I think we need to allow for things to disrupt, (laughs) 
<laughs> you know, and so that wasn't easy for me, but I needed to do it. And um, it, it began to help me. And my the person I was dating for s- some years afterwards, you know, he's an acupuncturist and a healer. Um, and he noticed something about my paintings. He said, Deanna, I think you keep painting the same colors and you're painting your ovaries and your uterus over and over and over again. And, you know, I, I think it's really interesting to have our creativity witnessed because there's something about the process itself and then the actual witnessing and what other people are seeing in it that you may not actually see. No, that's that's very inspiring because I'm sitting here in my art room. You can't see the massive art supplies, but it's very um, calming to go to the art store and look around and think of the possibilities. And, um, you know, in my clinical work, there's a right way and a wrong way to, yeah. to do it. And with art, there's no right way and wrong way. Yeah, very well said. And maybe we need to move ourselves out of the right and the wrong, the binary worlds, because life is more than that. It's actually a spectrum, mm-hmm. right? It's not black or white, yes or no. There are so many gradations and, you know, with nutrition, even so many people just want to get the answer, Deanna, soy, yes or no, eggs, yes or no. And I often say, I say, it's not a yes or a no. It's a maybe, it's a but, it's a perhaps, it's a depends. And it depends on that individual, depends on the quality of the food, it depends on the amount of the food, it depends on the time eaten, Mm -hmm. you know, so I kind of feel like nutrition is a little window into life in which it shows that life is not so cookbook. Life is actually pretty nuanced. Exactly. And once we uh, introduce that legalism, then we're doing more stress to our bodies and undoing, I think, any beneficial, potentially, or we're we're lessening the beneficial effects of those, you know, all those phytonutrients or whatever, once it becomes like, "Ah, don't eat that, Ah," you know. And, you know, people do look for this certain thing. And, you know, I totally agree with you. Life is just not that way. Your book does such a beautiful job of, of talking about that. Um, Deanna's book, latest book is quantum healing. And it's really quite a, a manual. I think, I don't know if that's how you initially, um, created it but to me it's a book that needs to be a hard copy I'm a hard copy girl because I like paper Ah, obviously but nevertheless a lot of people uh, listen to books on tape it might be great to do that but this is really this is get your highlighter get your colored pens and um go to town so um (laughs) I, I loved it I loved it and it it is the book that will stay on my main bookshelf because you know like you I probably you probably have 20 bookshelves and um they're taking over our home. And uh, so, so in quantum healing, one thing that was fascinating to me and new is the idea of flower essences Mm -hmm. as part of healing. So, so to our listeners, this was all new to me. Uh, Flower essences are substances extracted from flowering plants. Correct me, Deanna. Um, on anything, uh, but they're used therapeutically for mood and outlook and, you know, tell us everything about these flower essences. Well, that's nothing that I originated. That was me tapping into one of the modalities that I used for my own healing back in the, I would say back in my late twenties, again, where I was going through a lot of these issues. In fact, I remember one of the first flower essences that I used, it was yarrow. And at that time, I was experiencing so much sensitivity in my life. Uh, So I I just felt very permeable. Like I'd be around people and I would take on their emotions. I didn't have a very good sense of boundaries. I felt very emotionally vulnerable. And so I just started doing different things. I started reading about different modalities and I stumbled across flower essences. And flower essences are you know, and I'm not an expert in flower essences per se, but I have used them and I've used them with people. And it's taking the energetic imprint of the flower at a very symbolic level. So it's not thinking of the phytonutrients and all of the different actives in it from that perspective. It's taking the imprint at a very subtle level. And if each of the flowers represents something, 
you're imparting that energy from the flower into your own body at an emotional level. So I remember when I first went to a class and I had learned about yarrow and then I started to try it and I was thinking, okay, is this placebo? Is it really working? You know, you can't overdo flower essences per se because it, it's a very subtle remedy. So I kind of liken it to homeopathic remedies where you have something that is subtle, fine, in an imprint from that particular life form. So from pink yarrow, I was also experimenting with other kinds of yarrow, like there's gold or yellow yarrow, there's white yarrow. You know, if you get into flower essences, it's vast. And before I knew it, I bought the whole kit of flower essences, like a little pharmacy. And people can do that online where you can buy the different, you know, there are different brands where they do this. And so depending on how you feel, you can actually bring those essences into your everyday and say, oh, I need a little bit more calming or I need a little bit more, you know, what I find that they work best on is the emotional body. So they're going to be subtle. And for some people that are more emotionally sensitive, they may actually be very effective. So I brought those in into the the quantum healing book because I felt like it's a it's one of those modalities that gets overlooked and I think it complements things like supplements it complements things like affirmations meditation visualization a lot of the other things that I have in the book so I think it's a good place to start I mean even now Debbie I have to tell you so I have two cats and one of them is so stressed from a very young age she had so much trauma and you know she it, it's hard to deprogram that trauma from an animal once it it's really locked into that space even epigenetically so i started using with her bach flower remedies <laughs> and all i do with her is i put a couple of drops in the water that they're drinking out of and I was just telling my husband not too long ago, probably about a week ago, I said, have you noticed a difference in Leilani? Because I've been noticing that she's less kind of on edge and much more grounded. She can just kind of sit quietly. I don't know if that's from the flower essence, but I'm not ruling it out and I'm going to keep doing it. So that's just a little example of what it might be able to do. It works on our subtle aspects like our emotions. Oh, it's it's totally fascinating. So Bach is the brand you talked about in the book, and that's the brand you use personally. Yes. Okay, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. And I would say I, I'm not loyal to certain brands. Uh, so if people like a certain one and they, they find that certain other brands are good, like Flower of Life or, or Flower Essence Society, FES is another one. It's the purple one. I've used those. That's That was actually the kit that I bought when I first started to get into flower essences. So I like to kind of shake it up and uh, try out different ones, just trying things out. You know, one of the other things I didn't mention in the book, and I feel open to talk with you about it, is even things like crystals and stones, which, you know, when I'm thinking of energy, you know, what imparts energy? Food imparts energy of a variety of different types. Everything within our home is, you know, energy, how we make our way in the world. Art is energy. Creativity is energy. So we can bring in anything that keeps us grounded, anything that has significance for us, even wearing certain jewelry. You know, I think sometimes it's just a good mental reminder. If we wear something with intention or it, it connects to a memory or a loved one, then every time we see that jewelry, it's like, oh, yeah, let's, let's come back to that place. So I think that for <laughs> when it comes to healing, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to return to center. We're trying to return to that place of, you know, where we have the coherence or the resilience or the stillness where mind, body, spirit are all aligned. Yes. Well, in your book, you say that if we harbor emotions and don't express them, then they're likely to go somewhere and uh, you you emphasize um, you know becoming acquainted with emotions I thought that was really interesting because you know I can speak for myself I tend to intellectualize um, emotions and so I'm sure it's a challenge for a lot of people 
listening. So expand, Deanna, on what happens to our bodies when we harbor emotions. And and I'm sure you have some great strategies that we can use to become better acquainted with these emotions. Yes. And, you know, Debbie, I feel like it's, it's so uh, intuitive and interesting that you're bringing up emotions because, you know, even if we look at nutrition and eating, it's been estimated that over 75% of overeating is due to emotional reasons. And so often we just look to, oh, what's the diet I should follow? What's the food I need to be eating? We're not looking at the context of how we eat, when we eat, why we eat. It's always just what we eat. And I think that emotions are huge drivers. You know, when we're stressed, we tend to eat and have different sensory cues than we would have otherwise when we're not stressed. So I think emotions drive our behavior, our actions, our relationships. So it's huge. And when I think of the word itself, emotion, and I break it apart to e-motion, energy and motion, So when I think of emotions, I think of these things need to move. And back to when I was feeling very emotional and stressed out, I moved. I moved not my body per se, but I moved my emotions on on that big roll of paper with a lot of fluid paint. So I would say anytime that we feel emotional, how do we bring in movement? And that movement could be walking outside in nature, just going outside, reprogram the brain in that way. It might mean moving on a piece of paper, like you start doodling, like maybe you don't have time, like you and I, we have paints in our room and everything is kind of set up if we want to do that. Not everybody has that luxury, but what you can do is just get a, a pen and a piece of paper and just start, you know, let your mind go with that doodle wherever it's going to take you. And then I would say, When you ask about strategies, uh, in my other book, which is called Whole Detox, I have an emotional log. And the emotional log, I think, is really key because one of the things that I have found, Debbie, is that when I'm working with people, particularly in groups, most people have lost the lexicon of emotions. Mm -hmm. The lexicon or the language of emotions has become very mental, And what I mean by that is like when you ask people how they're feeling, they may say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm concentrating or, oh, I'm focused or, you know, a lot of head words. Those aren't feelings. Now, if we were to say, oh, I'm anxious or, oh, I'm um, I'm angry or I'm irritated or I'm frustrated or I'm sad, I'm grieving, you know, those are more emotional words. But we've been told in society, and I know me growing up, So I'm 52 and, you know, me growing up in the 1970s and the 1980s was very different than it is now. And back in the day, it was like, you know, don't show your emotions. That's weakness. You know, get, you know, get them under control. Come on, grow up, you know, don't be crying. You know, that's just, uh, you know, waste. It's, it's wasted time. Well, as we now know, emotional, emotional signals like that are powerful when it comes to health and disease. So one of the books that I remember is um, that, and I also use even now is Louise Hay's book, which is called You Can Heal Your Life. You know that one. Mm -hmm. So in the back of the book, she has emotional correlations with diseases and, or even symptoms, you know, just things that just come up, you know, and the one that I often think of is like allergies. I'll just give everybody an example. Like when I think of allergies, I think of how are we feeling in our environment? What are the emotions towards some of the seasonal shifts? Or maybe what is the feeling that we have about where we live? Do we like the state we live in? Do we like the home we live in? Do we like the land that we are on? I, I think that we you know we have to be looking at the feelings as it relates to any kind of symptom. And I think more and more doctors are acknowledging this. I I don't know if you've noticed that as well, but I have noticed that most times now we're starting to see that um, people are starting to connect those dots a bit better. I think so. Uh, And, you know, a a story I remember early in my practice in 1985, I'm, I'm, I'm a 64 push and 65, but um, the first time I became aware of this, there was a patient who, um, 
was very like bubbly and and then she comes in and she was shut down emotionally. And um, I found out that her husband had had an extramarital affair mm. and she literally like couldn't express anything about anything. And within probably, uh, well, less than a year, she got a really severe, aggressive form of breast cancer and she died. And oh I just remember th- not knowing anything about any of this, not understanding, you know, the connection at all, but thinking, wow, what, how did that all interconnect? Absolutely. And you can definitely connect those dots. You know, the heart is such an important area. It's still the number one killer in the Western world is to have some kind of cardiovascular indication or disease, right? And there's such a a connection between the mouth and Mm -hmm. the heart. We know that. So when you give that example of how she felt betrayed, you know, that's like such having such a heart connection to somebody in a relationship and then something happens, you know, feeling that congestion in the heart, the sadness in the heart. Um, I remember when my brother died, my brother died in a car accident. And shortly thereafter, my father developed uh, arrhythmia and all kinds of heart issues started to come to the surface. Now, he may not have seen them as being connected, but in my mind, it was pretty clear. (laughs) It was like, okay, you just lost your son. Like your heart is impacted, not just physically, but there's an emotional connection. And, you know, if we were just to think about in a creative way, we think of the body, you know, you're seeing me in my physical body. What if we had an invisible emotional body, a mental body, you know, a more subtle aspect where we receive information quickly before it even gets into the physical. And this is why I think it's so important for people to honor those emotions coming in before they get to the physical. Because once they're in the physical, now they have more of this prominence and more, I would say, gravitas. They have more momentum, right? So then we might start getting pains and aches that we haven't had before, um, you know, it's not always emotional. So, I, but I think what we need to do is we need to consider it like a palette of options to explore, you know, because for me, I had a number of reproductive issues and it was only when I started to explore different modalities, it was like, finally, I could find that key that opened the door to my healing, but I needed to explore many different things to get there. It wasn't like I just needed to take another supplement It was like I needed to take care of nutrition, plus I needed to take care of my emotional body, which I wasn't very attentive to because of all of the programming that I had had growing up of, you know, get over those emotions. Emotions are weakness. You know, don't cry. That looks like you can't get a handle on yourself. So, you know, and just for your listeners, there is some science on this. I believe it was out of 22 different emotions that were studied. The one that lasts the longest, actually, let's see, do you want to give a guess which emotion lasts the longest? Uh, we already mentioned it, I, actually. I don't think it's, uh, is it grief? I, I don't know. It's grief. It is. It is. You're spot on. Um, grief lasts the longest. And, um, you know, that's the one where I think societally we quickly try to resolve grief because it makes everybody, you know, if we're around a person who's grieving, we want to help them. We want to fix it. So we say, oh, you just lost your pet. Let's just go and get you another dog. Or, oh, you just lost, um, you, something happened in a relationship or you broke up with your boyfriend, girlfriend, or partner. Let's just, let me try to connect you with somebody I know who I think mm-hmm. you would be a good fit. Like we don't allow for the mourning process. We don't allow for that to happen. And my grandfather uh, was a funeral director. And so I always grew up around death. And I could see how, you know, being that he even lived in a, a on top of the a funeral home, like my grandma and my grandpa. Li- so I was always around that environment. And I could even see people at funerals and how in important it was to come together as a community, to come together and cry, to grieve, tell stories. Some people even celebrate and say like, oh, this person had, 
you know, they, they, they take a different approach to grieving. So grieving doesn't always have to look like crying. It can look however we want it to be. But I do think that grief is a difficult one because we want to shut it down. We want to correct it and solve it when really perhaps what it needs is to be expressed, aired out, vocalized, listened to, you know, just handing somebody that box of tissues for them to cry and just to sit in that space with them, similar to looking at an artwork on the wall, you know, you just sit with it, just sit with it and see what happens. That That is so wonderful. I remember, uh, you know, being raised similarly to you, you just, you didn't cry, especially being in um, the world of science, sort of in a more masculine world. Um, and I had quite a series of miscarriages and every time it was just like, no problem. It's okay. You know, it's okay. You know, I just, just reinforced myself. And even people would say, oh, well, it's all for the best. And, you know, um, one day I had a breakdown and I cried by myself for hours. And when my husband got home, I was like, I can't stop crying. What's wrong with me? Am I losing my mind? And you know, just sort of this, I don't know if that would be an amygdala hijack, if that's considered the same thing, but nevertheless, it had to come out to, yeah. to be healed. And I had no idea that so much was in there. It was, it was literally crazy. You know, it just, it's kind of scary, <laughs> you know, because I had been a person who's always strong and never cried in dental school, never, you know, um, regardless of what happens, just, you know, you're always strong. And uh, that's not life. That's not life. And to comfort people with respect to crying, you know, one of the things that we know about the literature on crying is that in the tears, so the lacrimal fluid from the eyes, when we get that, that tear fluid, it has inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. So in a way, it's helping the body to release inflammation, right? Just think of the stress of losing somebody, a pet, a home, whatever it is. You know, that can create this, it can ignite inflammatory processes in the body because of that stress. So we need to have all hands on deck in different ways to reduce that inflammation, that fire inside. So water is a great conduit to quelling fire. So it's kind of interesting how when you look at the tear, and you can find this, go to PubMed and just um, put in there looking for the scientific articles, look at, lac it'll typically be under lacrimal fluid, you know, which is the more sciencey word term for tears and cytokines, and then also chemokines. I think I remember reading that even in normal tears, so in a person who isn't grieving, you can still find up to something like 25 different chemokines and cytokines. So, and it changes, our tears change in composition. You know, I think our eyes are so, you know, there's that old saying, you know, the eyes are the windows to the soul. And I feel like there's so much about the eyes. The eyes are the window to the nervous system. The eyes are the windows to the brain. So the eyes are also taking in light and darkness signals that are changing hormonal signals, the circadian rhythm signals. You know, the eyes are just something that, um, you know, I think we can often use our eyes in an artful way and also in a perceiving way. And if we don't have our, our sight for some reason, you know, usually one of the other senses becomes heightened. Mm -hmm. You know, we are very sensory beings. And so, yeah, I just think that there's so much there with every organ. I know that you're focused a lot on teeth and the mouth, and that's like a universe. And I feel like every body part is actually a universe. The eye is a universe. The skin is a universe. And like, if we were just to take the part of our bodies that seems to be expressing and communicating to us that there's some kind of imbalance and go deep within and see that as a messenger, as a friend. You know, I remember I was uh, in the clinic years ago and somebody had said to me, a client had said that illness is the Western form of meditation. I don't know where she heard that from or if she just made it up, but it has always stuck with me. Illness is the Western form of meditation. So when something happens to us in a physical or even an emotional, mental way, we usually 
get stopped in some way. We get stopped in our tracks. Now we have to tend to our health. And so, you know, we might reflect in a different way about certain things. And that can go in multiple different directions. And I think that often people take on a negative feeling about the body part that might be giving them pain or some kind of trouble or it's inflamed or it is, um, you know, symptomatic in some way. Right. But I feel like, you know, that's like your friend. It's like that part of your body is the divining rod to your creative potential and your healing potential. So how do we better welcome our body and see it all as, you know, it's it's so much of who we are and reflecting back out what's happening. Well, and think about, you know, the Western way is to uh, just cover up that pain with a uh, maybe an analgesic, a painkiller, a shot, you know, whatever, not to deal with it. So yes. Yes. And and not to say that an analgesic isn't acceptable in sure. certain situations, which it can sure. be because it could be overwhelming. But I think, you know, I always ask, you know, what's under the pain? You know, what's the root cause of the pain? And then what's the root cause of the root cause? Like there could be multiple lines of root causes, right? And so until we address those rather than patch those, you know, I think we never fully resolve it. And maybe we even need to think symbolically about it too. Like I, I have a colleague, of a friend, and um, recently she was complaining about a pain in her neck. So she would wake up and she would come onto the calls that we would have. And, you know, she talks about, oh, this pain and, you know, it's stiff. And I asked her, I said, you know, what is... Do you, is there a pain in your neck? Like in an emotional way, like what's being the pain in your neck? You know, we, we even <laughs> use that phrase colloquially in our discussions with people like, oh, that person's such a pain in the neck or a pain in the butt. You know, yeah, sometimes yeah. we say that. Yeah. So sometimes our language is giving rise and giving away how things are configuring in the body. So I always like to look at, you know, what is that organ? What is that body part? What is that symptom really trying to tell us? Oh, and that's that really is rich. What, well, and that's what the quantum healing book is about. You know, mm -hmm. when I first put that together, it was a reference book. It's like, how do I help people to navigate their inner terrain from physical, emotional, mental, and even spiritual aspects? Because for some people, they feel much more safe with a physical roadmap and they won't even entertain the mental or the emotional or the spiritual until they got the physical down pat. And I think that that makes sense, right? So get your nutrition right, get your lifestyle right, sleep, relaxation, community, all of those things are essential. And then like peeling the layers of an onion. Okay, let's say you did all of those things and you did them perfectly, but you still have symptoms. So maybe there's another layer of that onion to peel back. Let's look at the emotional layer. What's there? Okay, we did some of that. We did the emotion law. We did some flower essences. We worked it out with a therapist. We talked it out. We created, we made art. We still have some residual symptoms. Okay, let's peel back another layer. Let's look at the symbolism of that. What is the lesson of that symptom? Rather than seeing it as something that is bad for us, is there any way in which it could be helpful for our, our growth and development as a person, right? So it's just kind of like peeling and peeling and peeling. It's like root cause after root cause. And, you know, I, I feel like, you know, many of us, Debbie, have have um, landed into the health field because we had a health issue. That's how we got here. <laughs> and it's like, well, you know, it, it, it's very much the same for me. I had so many issues when I was a teenager. And if I know, if I knew then what I know now, I could have had a very different adolescence, but it all was for good purpose because I don't think I would have used that as the springboard to, to move into all of these other areas and even to write the books, to do the teaching, mm -hmm. to talk with, you know what, it, it just wouldn't have been the same. Right. Your curiosity would not have been there. Um, I know you quoted Adele Davis, so you were looking at her early. I loved her. She was she was the first expensive book I ever bought when I was in college. I remember it was like 
ah, can I afford this? No, I want to afford this. Um, what was the name of that book again? Oh, because my oh, mom was the one that was I, really into her. I think I have it probably somewhere in some box. I, I don't, you know, I don't remember, but I remember just having that book and not having very many books. And, you know, she, and you said this in your book, she said that every single thing you do is shifting you in at the cellular, cellular level toward either wellness or toward disability. And, you know, we so tend to think, oh, everything we do, that's only food, that's only movement, that's only sleep, that's only, but, you know, your book does such a great job of saying, no, it's a whole lot of things. Um, and, uh, things that we can easily forget that, that help this terrain to get into the mode of healing. It's true. You know, no action is insignificant is basically what she's getting at. And some of my other teachers would suggest that as well. You know, there are other people that I've read books from. It sounds like, you know, I can see your library, a little window into that too. Um, you know, Carolyn Mace, Carolyn Mace was, yeah. um, she wrote this book called uh, Anatomy of the Spirit, which yeah. Oh my gosh, that that very much influenced my path. Um, then, of course, Louise Hay's books influenced me. Deepak Chopra's books. I remember his first book, uh, or one of his first books, if not the first one, I'm not sure, but it, Perfect Health. I remember thinking, oh, wow, this medical doctor is talking about energy. And, you know, then Larry Dossie, another medical doctor, talking about consciousness. So I, I soon began to see that, you know, as Dr. Jeff Bland would say, you have the leading edge and you have the bleeding edge. You know, I feel like a lot, you know, bleeding edge meaning, you know, too raw, too early for one's time. And I think that, um, you know, a lot of these people were very much on that leading edge where they were taking us into a new disruptive terrain. And sometimes it could feel that it was, you know, kind of um, trying to question the status quo how you know we see medicine how we see healing and it felt like it, it just felt very disruptive but these days I feel like we are very welcoming of that because we're all looking for new solutions and pushing that envelope a bit more which I think is good I you know now lately what I'm very much interested in is the quantum you know hence the, the name of the book mm -hmm. but actually going quantum meaning light light, sound, because I don't think everything needs to be so solid. I think it can be subtle. So when I think of, um, I mean, humming, I think of sound, listening to music, synchronization of the brain hemispheres through sound. Um, I just feel like there's so much being done in these different I would say areas of healing and wellness, you know, the whole thing with infrared light, you know, now we learn about toxic blue light at night, you know, we're just learning about more of the mm -hmm. subtle aspects in our environment that we may not have thought so deeply about before. So I like that. I like the idea of, you know, lasers, light therapies, colors of light, you know, back to color, you know, I, I do think that color is a great place to start for people. You know, what colors do you like to wear? What colors do you not like? You know, just even starting with one's wardrobe. I mean, everybody has a sense whenever I ask them in audiences, like, what's your favorite color? And even for people who can't see and maybe blind or color impaired, often there is a connection to color in a different way where they can feel or sense a color whether through temperature or there's some other type of dynamic. So I think color is a good place to start. For this interview, I don't know why, but, but I felt like blue-green was going to be the color. And I see you're wearing more of an indigo, uh, a bright blue, which is great. I'm sitting on a blue and chair. You know, it's like, I love blue. <laughs> <laughs> well, and your use of color, I think, really simplifies eating. Um, because you, when I first part of, you know, following you and reading your books, um, you really talked about just eating the rainbow. And to me, that is just so helpful. It's not like, oh, you must eat this, don't eat this. So tell us how that all um, transpired and, and what it means for our vitality to eat the rainbow. Yeah, that's a great question. Well, in my early days of being a nutritionist and, you know, finishing graduate school, I, I think that my persona as it related to nutrition was very commanding. 
It was all or nothing. It was black or white. It was like, you have to eat like this. And I noticed that I would be doing different diets that would change how I was counseling somebody. So if I was following a more vegetarian approach, then I would start to bring that into my work with people and say, no, this is really how you need to eat. So that was in my early days, like 25 years ago now. And I would say that um, I, I soon began, began to realize that nutrition was like a pendulum. Things were swinging. So it was, you know, I watched it because my PhD was all on fats and I watched that pendulum swing with fats, saturated fat, no saturated fat. Yes, saturated fat, chain length, you know, all type of saturated. <laughs> it just got so messy and polarizing and people mm -hmm. were using how, and they even do it today, of course, you know, how they eat and then putting their stake in the ground and saying, mm -hmm. you know, this is how I believe everyone needs to eat. So I realized that, you know, eating is something that we all share in. It's something that unifies us as people. So as a scientist, I was thinking, how do I unify people? How do I make eating fun? Because eating wasn't always fun for me and it wasn't always fun for the people I was working with. So then I just, if I was thinking about the science, the way that I thought about it was, you know what? I could cherry pick studies on eggs and I could convince you that eggs were good or bad, depending on my position. I could do the same with meat. I can do the same with soy. I mean, you can list the whole barrage. Of, I can do the same with dairy. I mean, if you if we were in debate class and you said, Deanna, you've got the pro dairy and I've got anti. I mean, I could take either side and basically come at it from picking science. What I didn't feel that we could pick sides on was plant foods. I felt that when I looked at the science of fruits and vegetables, and let's just stick with those two for a second, because you could say, well, whole grains and nuts and seeds and spices and, but just in general, fruits and vegetables, it seemed to me that there was no arm wrestling, that that was pretty clear cut, that epidemiological studies, prospective clinical trials, animal studies, sell assays. I mean, it just chalked up to, you know, a preponderance of data, almost irrefutable. So then I thought, okay, I like this idea, but maybe people can just use that as the common denominator of their eating. And then the keto people can eat a certain way. The vegans can eat a certain way, the omnivore, but then we all have a foundation that unifies us. And from my read of the science and phytonutrients, what I was seeing was that different phytonutrients were in different colors of food and those colors of food had certain functions like red foods helping with the immune system orange foods helping with reproductive function yellow foods digestive health green foods the heart blue purple and the brain so i started to see that there was a code if you will kind of a loose code but still there was kind of a pattern recognition here so then uh, and then that also was coinciding with how I was seeing the body from a more spiritual or energetic perspective. And so then I just started to put that out as the rainbow diet. I, the diet word wasn't my preference, but the publisher said, well, that's how people think of food mm -hmm. and eating. And I said, okay, but I don't really mean a diet when I'm, I, I'd rather just say eat the rainbow because as long as you get the colors. And I also feel, Debbie, that like a five-year-old understands this, a 25-year-old, a 50-year-old, an 80-year-old. Like it's, a, again, I'm trying to think of like, how do we unify people rather than divide them and say, you know, in this righteous way, my way of eating is better than yours. Like, I just don't feel eating is meant to be divisive. I feel like it's meant to be communal, unifying, and even a spiritual act of connection. So that's how I got there. <laughs> uh, it's beautiful. And I totally agree. Uh, eating can harm relationships. You know, it's all about relationships. Nothing will be more stressful for a person than to have a relationship problem. And uh, food should be unifying. Uh, and I uh, I love the way you do the colors. The, I made um, uh, briami the other night. I'm not sure I'm saying that right. But it's just um, a dish where you throw all these vegetables in. Yeah. So, you know, getting ready to get to meet you, uh, I thought, okay, 
I had tomatoes. I had sweet potatoes. I had Yukon golds. I had zucchini. I had onions. Um, I had eggplant. I don't know. I'm probably missing a color, but I had everything. I had the rainbow. So that's I was like, beautiful. Dr. Minnick would love this. And, um, and it was delicious and it changes seasonally. That's what's so nice about your, mm-hmm. um, perspective is that you don't get stuck eating one food all the time. You sort of think, okay, it's fall. What's, what are the fall foods that fit into this um, yes. way of looking at it? It's great. It's eating, you know, it's just a, it's more what our bodies are designed for, I think. Yes. And I also think it just makes eating more fun. It takes us out of the head and into the heart and into the art. Into the art. Yes. You know, oh, it becomes that's... less about nutrition and nutritional analysis. And it's like, you know, don't focus on that. Just focus on eating the colors. And, and, you know, I think for most people, they stay with that longer than if they had to think about, oh, I need to get my protein, my carbohydrate. You know, mm-hmm. some people I had just noticed clinically that that just added to the problems and the issues and the the mental, emotional stress for people. I I found that when people thought about just eating the rainbow, it's almost like it became not even lower in stress, but more fun and more full of joy to do that. Exactly. And more choices. I, I, you know, I see patients for their oral microbiome and then that translates to their gut microbiome. So I do, I do a lot of wellness coaching. Um, and I tell people, if you don't like it, spit it out. I mean, eat food you love, find yeah. good food you love because it's just so much a part of our lives and life is just too short to be, you know, holding your nose and stuffing something down that you think is good for you. That's going to undo once again, any benefits, I think. Yes. I, I, I do feel like there has to be a receptivity. You have to love, you know, I always feel like when I love doing something, I, it doesn't feel arduous. It doesn't feel mm-hmm. taxing. It just feels natural. And I think that some people find there are creativity in the kitchen, you know, when, um, if I think of some of the food products that are out there, some of them evolved and were developed because people had food sensitivities or intolerances. So they had to get creative. So they started putting things in a food processor and blending it up, making bars, making little snack balls. Um, And so, you know, sometimes where we feel constraint can actually open up into creative expression, even with food. And I have found this for myself. So I have three principles when it comes to food and eating and even life, really. The first one is color, which we talked a lot about. The second one is creativity, which we also talked about. The third one is variety. And that one we didn't talk a lot about, but I do want to weave it into the discussion because I do think that when we have variety, we build resilience. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. So if somebody were to take a different way to work, maybe to their office in the morning, if they were to constantly reroute and try different types of ways of getting there, that's building brain resilience and neuronal plasticity. When we have um, different foods on a daily basis and we start to rotate every three to four days, we're bringing in a different food that we haven't had for the past three days. We're building the resilience of the gut. That's called metabolic, well, in some way it's called metabolic flexibility or encouraging a healthier, I would say fortified gut microbiome, which will build immune resilience. So I do think that variety whether it's mental, emotional, physical, it could mean relationships, getting out of your ruts. I think that so many people aren't healing from from certain things because they're in a rut. They're doing the same thing every day. Mm -hmm. They're not changing anything. And if we just continue to do the same thing without changing, then how can we expect a different result? So I do think that um, changing things up. So for me, what I'm focusing on now, because I've got the color down, I've got the creativity down. But when it comes to my food, I've been playing around with this concept of diversity more and more, Mm -hmm. you know, aiming for at least 50 unique foods every week, doing that with spices, doing that with tea, doing it with, you know, changing up brands. You know, sometimes we get locked into a brand even a personal care product, even a makeup, even clothing brands. 
it's like, well, what if we changed up this and how would we, you know, it just requires us to be a little bit on our toes, right? And I think it's, um, it enriches us in some way. So I think that the variety piece is important. So again, color, creativity, and variety. And I take that that three-prong approach to food, to life, to relationships. I think all of that is is really key. I think so too. I, I love having friends who are not like me. And <laughs> I mean, that's one of my, you know, one of my sort of goals is to get to know people who are not like me. Um, because I'm not going to learn anything from anybody who's just like me. And, um, so I think that's a really wonderful approach. Uh, I put parsnips in that, uh, Briami also, and, you know, that was kind of a food yeah. Deanna, that three years ago I didn't, didn't, I bypassed in the grocery store, but, you know, surprisingly they, uh, they're pretty good. So it, it's a fun challenge. I mean, so it's so you really set the bar high on, you know, every week you're trying new things. Wow. Or just one new food, you know, um, don't, uh, I, I would say, don't let it stress you out. Um, you know, if you're thinking about that, but you know, it, it might be variety in a, a, a relationship or a connection to a person, uh, or it might be looking at a different social media page, watching a different series. Um, if that's something I like to do, picking up a different kind of book, you know, so often you and I go to medical conferences all the time. That's how we first met. I like to go to conferences that have nothing to do with medicine or healing sometimes. And I just like to go to somewhere where I feel like I'm a little bit on the outside, you know, just to get my neurons cross talking and just for me to see how other groups of people are doing what they're doing, you know, and I think that that's really important so that we stay very, again, neuronally nimble and also, you know, connecting into the rest of the body, you know, the heart, the gut, all of it kind of falls in place with all of that variability. I think it's good for us. Hmm. I totally agree. Neuronal nimbleness is a, a great <laughs> term that's probably going to be in the show notes. I love that. That's, oh, you've just been a joy, Dr. Deanna Minnick. I mean, thank you so Aww. much for saying yes to my invitation. Thank you for your time. I, I want to respect it. I could, we could talk all day. There's so many thoughts were going through my mind, but um, I know you've, you've got a lot of work to do today. So, so how can people connect with you? Yeah, I would say that the best way is my website, which is my name, deannaminnick.com, D-E-A-N-N-A-M-I-N-I-C-H. And Debbie, I would say on the site, um, you know, we started talking about nerds. So just to close with the nerd aspect, if you like to nerd out on a lot of the sciencey aspects of nutrition, you could check the blog page. If you're less about the nerding out and you're more about the creative educational aspects, go to the resources tab where you can find a number of different downloads that might kind of uh, get you going in a creative way. Oh, that's great. And be sure, folks, and um, check out this book. As I said, it's a, it's a book you kind of want in your library because it's it's a really interesting manual. And I'm excited to order some flower essences. That just oh, sounds good. great. <laughs> well, let me know how it goes for you, Debbie. I, sh I sure will. I sure will. Uh, well, thank you all for joining us today for Vitality Made Simple. Uh, we're now in 103 countries and 2,900 cities. So, and that's all because you all have been sharing. I've, you know, I've just recently been on, uh, become on Instagram and Dr. Minnick is on Instagram. She has a really fun Instagram. So join us both there. Uh, thank you for listening and blessings until next time.